Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest is Dan Ward. He is Principal Systems Engineer at MITRE. He's an innovation consultant, and he is an author of multiple books. Dan, I am so thrilled to have you for this conversation today. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me on the show. My goodness, there's so much for us to talk about. I want to talk about failure. I want to talk about simplicity, complex systems. Uh, I want to talk about your new book, Lyft, and... um, Also, the fact that we're all working virtually right now, we're in a strange time. So let's just start with that. How are you doing? Uh, Doing pretty well. You know, early on, we kind of made a a little casual schedule for the day and we called it how to have a good day. And it had things like get up by eight, uh, take a shower by nine, ask somebody how they're doing by five o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, And my two daughters uh, and my my wife and I have all been trying to sort of follow that that pattern for the day. And on the days we do that, it definitely seems to help. I love that idea of asking someone how they're doing before the workday is over. I think one of the things I miss the most about living in society with others is just those happenstantial encounters in the elevator or as you're walking down the sidewalk and just sort of being able to spark up a short conversation with someone and see a different face. It's odd to not have that. So doing proactive outreach to ask someone outside of your home how they're doing, that's a really, really good idea for, for sort of living holistically right now. Yes, yeah, so important to have those connections. Uh, in fact, an, an experiment we recently did with some folks I work with, uh, we called it a virtual ambient huddle. So everybody dialed into the same Zoom room. We put our cameras off and we turned our, our mics on mute and we just sort of quietly worked you know, on our own individual things. It wasn't like a meeting where we had an agenda. And then anytime somebody had a question or you wanted to sort of compare notes to somebody, you'd come off mute and you would you'd sort of speak into the room. And it was just this amazing experience that we were all working together, having that sort of virtual ambient connection. Uh, and my favorite part was at some point somebody left their mic on and you could hear them breathing in the background. It was <laughs> lovely. It was so oh. nice to just hear this. And it wasn't like, you know, heavy, weird breathing. It was just a faint in and out of breath. And it was just I'm like, oh, we should have been doing that from the beginning. Wow, that just makes my heart beat kind of faster <laughs> thinking about that. It's true. All those tiny little moments where we connect as humans, um, if we're not doing intentional work like that uh, right now, it, that can feel like it's lost in some ways. So I love that example. Thanks for sharing that. Sure. So Dan, you are an innovation storyteller. Um, of course, you're an engineer by trade, you're an author, but in all of your books and all of your presentations um, and all the social media that you put out there, I can tell that you are a powerful storyteller. So I'm, I'm dying to ask you what role you feel storytelling plays in innovation. Oh, I, th- I think it's absolutely critical. And you're right, I'm an electrical engineer is my undergrad. Uh, I have a couple of master's degrees in other types of engineering and uh, spent 20 years in the Air Force as a military technologist. Uh, and so that, that's not the typical set of credentials for a, a storyteller, but I, I figured out pretty early on, and I, I remember so vividly uh, as a young captain in, in the Air Force, realizing that like the best ideas in the world are absolutely worthless if you can't express them clearly to the people around you, to you know your, your fellow travelers and the, you know, the people whose heads you're trying to get into. And uh, through a number of different you know, books I read and, and classes I took and, and conversations I had with people, uh, I sort of learned that telling stories is just a really effective way uh, to develop your own understanding uh, of ideas and things, but also to build that shared understanding. Uh, so storytelling, like you said, is absolutely key to my own understanding of, of what work I do and, and how the world works, and then building that shared understanding with the folks around me. You know, let's let's pause for a second. I want to say thank you, first of all, for your service. You were a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force for 20 years and six months. That's incredible. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey from there into the innovation space? Yeah, so I think there were two main triggers to get me into doing this thing called innovation. Uh, first was a lot of reading. Uh, Tom Peters in particular, I think he was the mm-hmm. first kind of management guru and writer that I, I encountered and he was just really significantly influential in in my professional development and, and continues to be and, and he's still brilliant on Twitter uh, even today his most recent book uh, continues to impress and inspire 
and he has a very story-based approach to, to his work. Uh, so along with reading, there was also a lot of reflection. And uh, again, I vividly remember as a young captain sitting at my desk, and I, I can picture the desk so clearly, uh, asking myself a really important question. Like, why do some military technology programs cost more, take longer, and do less than they promised? And then why do some other projects deliver ahead of schedule and under budget and do more than they were designed to do? And, and I didn't know the answer to that question. And it, and it bothered me. And I'm like, well, what's different between these two categories of technology development projects? So I began doing some uh, very informal research at first and then a little more formal into my, my, first, uh, my, my second master's degree uh, and doing a lot of writing on this area and doing some experiments on my own career. And I realized that my biggest frustrations and failures were inevitably when I was part of a cast of thousands spending decades and billions trying to build something. Mm. All my proudest moments, all my biggest successes were when I had no time, no money, a really small team, just a really important mission. And we kind of got it done without a lot of resources. Uh, so my wow. big conclusion was that uh, speed, thrift, and simplicity are really the key uh, attributes of any successful technology development program. And that if I just say speed, thrift, and simplicity are the key attributes of a technology development program, nobody's going to remember that. So what if I tell stories about, hey, this project went this way and this other project went that way, and here's how we made decisions and here's how we solve problems, uh, and give those examples in the context of an actual spacecraft or a fighter jet or any other kind of exciting looking technology, uh, that approach helps share and spread that idea. Yes. And so tell us about, you know, I think this is really the, the core thesis, right? But within some of your books. So the book Fire, How Fast, Inexpensive, Restrained, and Elegant Methods Ignite Innovation. And then your other book, The Simplicity Cycle, A Field Guide to Making Things Better Without Making Them Worse, which by the way, is probably the best title <laughs> of <laughs> any you, book. Titles are so hard. I, titles are so hard. And I was so pleased with the, the subtitle for The Simplicity Cycle in particular. Yeah. How did you ideate that title? I love it. Oh, um, iteratively. <laughs> in the word. Uh, we had so many different versions and uh, you know, writing a book is a lot of effort. Coming up with a title for a book that you've written is, is even more effort, I think. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a and, lot of pressure around that. Yes, yeah. So, so we tried a, a number of different things. And then when, you got to, when we got to that one, making things better without making them worse, I was like, oh, that's it. That, that's what it's about. So this concept of simplicity and simplicity design, I think at this point, it's really taken hold of the innovation community, right? So we have lean innovation and the lean startup methodologies really at this point being the predominant uh, and agile approaches. Those are really the predominant ways to approach innovation and the design sprint. And this, to me, the, the methods that you're like the sort of theory behind that work is the simplicity cycle and fire. Um, to me, that, that really is, is part of that larger conversation. Do, do you agree? Yeah. In fact, The Simplicity Cycle was the second book that got published, but it was actually the first one I wrote. Uh, and, and when I proposed it to the, my agent and my, my publisher, I said, you know, this is part of a larger concept that's about speed, thrift, and simplicity. And they said, oh, well, give us a proposal for that one. And they said, well, let's do the fire book first. I'm like, but I haven't written that one yet. <laughs> I have to, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so I, I had The Simplicity Cycle mostly written at that point. So I had to really quick like write the, the fire book, you know, thinking I had more time to do that. I, I, it turns out I did not. So um, I put that one together in about four months. Um, but really, that was wow. a ten year ten year project because I had really begun the research and the work on that you know, over the past decade leading up to that, uh, you know, getting that actual book contract. Isn't that incredible? How knowledge can build and build and build, and then you have to work within such a finite amount of time to get it articulated and out there in the world. Did it, did that feel like a surreal process? It, it really kind of was. And, and fortunately I've, I've been a collector of stories for a long time. So it was just a matter of figuring out, okay, which of the stories that I need to tell in what order, you know, to sort of make a coherent, larger narrative. And I now worked my, my editor over at uh, Harper Collins was just brilliant and terrific. And the most common feedback I got from her was, you know, hey, I need one more story in, in chapter two here. Uh, you know, in this paragraph, expand that into another story. And, and that's just the, the best kind of, I think, the best kind of editing feedback to get, as opposed to, you know, you use the word kabillion. It should have been kajillion. 
I actually got that feedback from my, our copy editor as well. <laughs> 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 that's hilarious. I love it. Yeah. It, you know, the simplicity cycle starts with really powerful storytelling right out the gate. So can you take us into how you organized? You said you're you're kind of a collector of stories, that you are always paying attention and, and kind of a believer that that stories could help motivate or inform or win champions and get buy-in. Can you tell us what that actually looked like for you in your writing process as you were putting these books together? Did you sort of have an ongoing Google Doc or a spreadsheet or how did you organize and keep track of all of the stories that ultimately became the heart and soul of your books? Yeah, oh, that's a great question. Um, I actually write, I'm a, write all my books out in, uh, by hand on uh, a notebook for my first draft. And really, does, I, I do, I do. That, that does a couple of things for me. Um, the pace of writing, just the physical pace of, of writing with a pen on paper tends to line up with the pace of my thought. So, okay. you know, whereas if I'm typing, my fingers can get ahead of me or I can't quite keep up, but there's something about that physical experience of, of putting ink on paper uh, that just lines up well with the, the speed at which my, my brain is operating. Uh, the other, really, the, the most important thing this does for me is it forces me to revise. It forces yeah. me to edit <laughs> because once I've written it on a paper, I now need to type it. Uh, and that means every single word that I've written down has to get typed. Yes. Whereas if I compose on a keyboard, I can get lazy. If I compose mm-hmm. on a keyboard, there's nothing forcing me to go back and revisit every single word. Uh, and that's such an important component of the writing process is to do those revisions because good, good writing is just bad writing that's been rewritten. <laughs> this lets yeah. me sort of take my bad writing and, and forces me to rewrite it. And I do have a fun little technique and I use uh, like spiral bound notebooks and I, I write the uh, the main text that I'm writing on the right hand side uh, and I don't write on the back side of the paper uh, but as, I, as I'm looking at my notebook laid out in front of me the left side the, like the back side of the sheet of paper is, is blank there and that gives me space where as I'm going through and rereading it you know like oh there's something I meant to mention but how do I fit that in between these two paragraphs on my on my main thread I can flip over to the left side and, and there's a whole extra blank sheet of paper there, a big blank side. I can write my stuff there and just do a little arrow and draw it in. Um, and again, that gives me that freedom, that physical space to capture that stuff, uh, which if you're typing on a keyboard, it's not a problem. But when you're doing it on, on paper, you have to overcome that, uh, the, the difficulty of how do you insert something new in between you know, two paragraphs where you don't really have space to do that. The, that left side gives me that space. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love getting really clear insights into how someone creates a book or, or puts their thoughts and, and their insights together in a way that, that organizes them. And that's, really, that's a really neat model to, to really think about and, and enact the idea that writing is recursive and mm. the, best, the best writing takes time. It takes, it takes returning back to those same words and refining them. And, and I like that you pointed out the importance of speed too, which I think there's so many options now for creating content. Um, for example, voice activation now or voice uh, dictation, a lot of people like to use that. But it's interesting, that's even, that's sort of hyperspeed yes. <laughs> oh, beyond, sure. beyond typing and that, that can be even more challenging. Um, but I've, I've seen other writers who are able to sort of talk out their thoughts first and then take that draft and start to refine it. Um, but speed is such an interesting variable when it comes to trying to get our thoughts down. Yeah, absolutely. And, and speed is actually a big theme in a lot of my, my work, especially the first book, the, the fire book. Uh, and I make the point that speed, uh, it, there's a difference between being fast and being hasty. So I talk about speed with discipline. And so speed that gets you to the finish line in the least amount of time possible, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, sprinting. I mean, I, I say that the, in the famous uh, Aesop's fables, the tortoise was faster than the hare. The tortoise uh-huh. got to the finish line first. And, and that's the point, isn't it? Uh, and so there's a, there's a type of speed that can be sloppy. There's a type of speed that can be hasty and, and cutting corners that shouldn't be cut. Uh, and so I talk about speed with discipline. Uh, sustainable speed. If, if you're operating at a speed that you can't keep up that pace, then, then you're going too fast. And ultimately that's, a, that's going to be slower in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. And can lead to burnout so quickly. For sure. Among your innovation teams as well, or errors or mistakes that can lead to failure. I love that you tackle failure in mm-hmm. a lot of your work. Can you share with us some of your 
views on the role that, that storytelling plays inside failures in the innovation process? Yeah, so failure is a big theme in my, my latest book, Lift. Uh, the subtitle for that one is Innovation Lessons from Flying Machines That Almost Worked and the People Who Nearly Flew Them. We're looking at flying machines from the late 1800s, so in the decades right before the Wright brothers came along and, and built the first airplane. A number of other people tried building flying machines, and they were not as successful as Orville and Wilbur. Uh, and parenthetically, we really should refer to them as the Wright siblings because their sister Catherine was a, a huge partner, uh, played a huge role in that work. And, and so it wasn't just the two boys, it was uh, all three of them. And so I, I do try to remember to refer to the Wright siblings, not just the Wright brothers. You know what? I actually never heard that before. Yeah, uh, she's largely overlooked, uh, even though Wilbur himself said, if, if history ever thinks of, of us in the context of aviation, they must remember our sister as well, because she was wow. so influential and so involved in the whole thing. Uh, their first flight was 1903. The first book about her, it was titled The Right Sister, came out in 2003. So 100 years later, it's just inexcusable that she's been overlooked. I've been thinking our headquarters for Untold is in Cincinnati. We're about 45 minutes from the birth of aviation right. and everything about Dayton, Ohio is, you know, themed towards the Wright brothers. And exactly. uh, that's, that's really interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just, I'm a big fan of, of her contribution to aviation. Um, but so the, the book lift is all about failure and, and studying failure and really calling it failure and being honest about our failures. Uh, and so the, the, the main theme is about how do we, what does it look like to really study failure and, and learn from it in a way that helps advance the field, whatever the field is you're working in. Uh, and in the late 1800s, the field was aviation at a point in time when that problem had never been solved. No one had ever succeeded. So the only thing you could do was study failure. Um, and, you know, today, oftentimes, you know, the, the scientific community in particular has a challenge with not publishizing their negative results. Mm. You know, if you're going to publish a scientific paper, you say, we did this experiment and this is what we learned and it was a big success. But if you did an experiment that did not give you the results you were looking for, we'll never speak of that again. And, and we bury it and nobody ever hears about it. And, and what that leads to is somebody else is going to go do that exact same experiment, get the exact same results. And that's just wasted time because, you know, that was already a, 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 a performed experiment. We don't need to repeat that one. Um, Great so, point. Uh, the new book is really inspired by uh, a book published in 1894 by a guy named Octave Chanute. Uh, it was called Progress in Flying Machines, and, and he basically studied 400 years and documented 400 years of failed aviation experiments. Wow. And he was trying to figure out three things. Like, first, is, is flight possible? Is it even theoretically possible to build a flying machine capable of carrying a person into the sky? And he correctly determined that, yes, I, I think it's possible. Uh, his second goal was to figure out what are the dead ends? What are the, the bad ideas we should just stop doing? And he correctly identified that like gluing feathers onto your wings, probably you don't need to do that. We can all <laughs> stop gluing feathers onto our wings, right? Uh, and then the third goal was to identify what are the most promising pathways? What are the, the things that are most likely to lead to success? And he correctly identified, for example, that uh, static wings are better than flapping wings. You know, even though birds, bugs, and bats all flap their wings to fly, and you know, it's just self-evident. This is how nature flies. This is how humans should also fly. He's like, no, flapping wings are not the way to go. That your wings can be stable. They can be static, uh, and, and you can produce lift with wings that do not flap, uh, which was a remarkable discovery. And, and he did that experimentally, and he did that, did that by studying what worked and what didn't, and what had been attempted and what had been accomplished. So yeah, chapter one in my new book is all about uh, Chanute and his research. And then there's, there's four other main characters in the book. Uh, it's really telling their stories. So it's a book about history, but it's really modern innovation lessons from these historical stories. What surprised you in terms of the, the greatest sort of lessons from failure? Were there, what to you was the most exciting discovery in the process of researching this book when it comes to how we view failure? Oh, uh, hmm. you know, I was really struck by, by the visuals, by the images. Uh, Chanute's book is full of these just gorgeous line drawings of absolutely bonkers flying machines. Uh, things that you just look at and think, oh my gosh, I would love to have seen somebody try and fly with that, even though I knew it would never work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, as a writer, I, I spent a lot of time with words. And so it was a bit of a humbling experience to, to come to that realization that you know, a picture really is worth a thousand words. And, and the 
importance of visuals and, and graphics as a companion to storytelling um, wasn't a, a concept that I, I came into this project in, in, with that in mind, but it was really one of the key takeaways, and, and that is to, to use images, to use drawings and pictures and, and visuals as a way to communicate the, the ideas and the, and the stories that we're trying to tell. In order to really help the modern reader understand the level of risk, the level of ideation that had to go into the, those, those first concepts of flight, I mm. think you're right. We, we had to hear the story. We had to see the visuals in order to really get a, a full grasp of the kind of risk taking in their thinking that that, that, that had to take. Yeah, they, some of these folks were taking just breathtaking levels of, of physical risk. Uh, and uh, of the five main characters that I write about in the book, uh, one of them did die in a, in a glider accident. Mm. You know, so, so these were risks that actually uh, were in the engineering parlance. They were realized. You know, we, we, they encountered the negative consequences that, that they had exposed themselves to. Um, you know, fortunately, uh, many of them survived uh, and uh, you know, did make progress in the direction of, of solving the problem of flight. Um, but yeah, the, the risks are just uh, virtually incomprehensible to me. Uh, and the only way I can kind of make sense of them is that the risk of flight was deemed to be acceptable. They, they, they were willing to accept the physical risk because the risk of never flying was unacceptable. Mm. Like they just, they could not live with never having attempted to fly. Uh, living just life on the ground was, was an unacceptable risk. Uh, and so they decided to accept this other risk. And, and that's what engineers always do is, you know, we're always evaluating a variety of different risks and trying to figure out which ones are the risks we're going to accept and which ones are the, which risks are the ones we're going to avoid. And I want to dive deeper into something you said a few moments ago about failure stories and the mm -hmm. lessons we learn from failure and whether we choose to communicate failures or not and why. And this idea that our scientific research or our, our innovations, when they fail, there's a lot of shame um, and fear in, in, in communicating those failures, or even, like you said, calling it failure in the first place. Yeah. It sounds as though the, the act of storytelling around failure, if the, the risk of not being able to call something a failure and discuss it and storytell around it is that those lessons that you learned in the process will never get shared. And, and something is a far worse failure if there's no learning coming from it, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And in my, my first book, I talk about two types of failure, optimal failure and epic failure. So an optimal failure costs you a little and teaches you a lot. An epic failure is the other way around. It costs you a lot and teaches you a little. So yes. failure is inevitable. Like failure is going to happen no matter how lucky or smart or hardworking or tall or good looking you are, like sometimes things just aren't going to go your way. There's going to be failures. So while we can't avoid failure entirely, we can influence the direction in which we will fail. We can influence the types of failure we've exposed ourselves to. Uh, and so back to that idea of speed, thrift, and simplicity, when you have a small team with a short schedule, a tight budget, uh, that type of project only fails one way. It only fails optimally. And we haven't exposed ourselves to a lot of loss. Our our uh, exposure to risk is generally minimal. Whereas if you're spending decades and billions, when that kind of project fails, man, it hurts a lot. You've invested billions of dollars into this and it mm -hmm. failed. Those billions are just gone. And if you spent decades on it, it's, it's just that much harder to really get learning uh, out of a longer term project like that. Because by the time we learn anything, it's sort of too late to even apply some of those things. Uh, and it's harder to get the visibility into the learning because the decisions we made 10 years ago are coming to bear fruit now, do we even remember what those decisions were and do we see the cause and effect relationship? So it's much easier to get cause and effect relationships on a short schedule. And so that's you know, one of the big reasons I say small team, short schedules, tight budgets, uh, that fosters more learning and helps us tell the story better. So interesting. Are there certain methodologies in the innovation world that you think are more suited for that type of approach? Yeah, I think you see a lot of that in like the, the lean startup type uh, approach, uh, agile software development, anything that, that encourages you to incrementally, iteratively do a, a series of experiments, reflect on those experiments and have each one build on the next. Uh, so that's kind of the, the better known methods uh, that, that help support that. Uh, a specific technique that my team and I use that uh, I hope catches on, I hope everybody starts doing this, 
um, we call it a failure cake. Yes, I was going <laughs> to ask you about this because you were the first person uh, who introduced me to this concept, and I've mentioned it on the podcast before. So shout out to oh, you shout out to you. No, yes. no, this is great. I, I don't know if that episode has aired yet, but please tell us about the failure cake approach. I love this. Excellent. We are so delighted to do failure cakes. And uh, once this whole social distancing thing is over, we're looking forward to doing them again. Um, uh, there, there's two versions of the failure cake. And, and the first one was my team and I put in a proposal to, um, to, to get some funding for, uh, for an activity we were going to do. And we didn't get picked. Uh, we, we did not get selected and we didn't get funded. And so one of the members of the team went to a grocery store, bought a cake, had them write congratulations on your failure <laughs> on the cake. And brought it into the office and we all sat around and we ate the cake and we reflected and we discussed what we had attempted and, and, and how it didn't work out. Now, this cake was bigger, like it's not a very big team. So the cake was bigger than we could eat just among ourselves. We then brought the cake into the hallway uh, and we shared slices of the cake with the people in, in the hall. And people were like, oh, is this somebody's birthday? And we said, no, no, this is a failure cake. We are celebrating the fact that we tried something. This, this failure shows that we, we put ourselves out there. We, we took a go at it. Uh, and there's something comforting about sharing that cake with your friends. So we've done that a couple times with, with that team because my team keeps trying stuff and sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. And we say, hey, even when it doesn't work out, at least we get a cake out of it. <laughs> but then the, the variation on that theme, we got a really big sheet cake, like one of the biggest ones we could get at the, at the store. And we set up a table in our um, company cafeteria and we had a whiteboard and, and a bunch of little yellow stickies uh, and the cake said, celebrating our failures. And the the offer was, come get a piece of cake and come share a failure story. And you would, the people would write down their failure on a little yellow sticky and stick it up on the whiteboard. So give us a failure, we give you some cake. And it was just <laughs> this amazing experience. I mean, some of the stories were funny, some of them were poignant. Uh, and it really helped reduce some of that shame that we you may you mentioned the word shame earlier, shame around failure. We were recognizing everybody fails. Uh, and we can be honest about the failure. And the, having something sweet, having that cake helps reduce the, the pain and the, the shame of that experience. And when we're all in this together and we're sharing these stories around food, you know, storytelling and food go together so well, uh, and we're doing it publicly, uh, it was just a really beautiful experience. And that's, again, once we're all back in the same building again, it's something anybody can do. You can just, whatever company you, are, you work with, wherever you are, go buy a cake set it up in the cafeteria, set it up some public place and say, give us a failure story. We'll give you a piece of the cake uh, and just watch the, the magic unfold. Thank you so much for, for sharing the full story around that. Uh, you know, it, and just kind of hearing a little bit about it uh, on LinkedIn, I thought, oh, that's really, that's a cool idea. That's, that's really nice. But I didn't, it didn't really resonate with me at, at the same level as hearing you explain it here <laughs> on this podcast, because that deeper ability to say, we're celebrating the fact that we tried, the way that that can shift a culture, the way that that can help empower people to put themselves out there and take some risks. Uh, you know, I, I think we're all you know, all of the, uh, these you know, stage gate processes and innovation processes are in place to help create checks and balances and, and red lights and green lights. And I think all of that is critical. And obviously, also all the methodologies around um, evaluating and getting feedback before you move on to the next uh, scale of your, of your idea. But all of that in mind, I think there's still at the heart of it, if you're not willing to think big or dream bigger than the way you've always done things, Right, you're just that part of the innovation culture. You'll you'll stagnate. I love absolutely uh, Jeff Bezos in in his letter to shareholders in 2019. He said, "You need to expect bigger failures now because we're going to start taking bigger risks." Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and uh, I remember in the in the 90s, NASA had their faster, better, cheaper uh, initiative where they were trying to figure out ways to get low cost access to space and. Uh, Dan Golden was the administrator of NASA at the time, and he said, look, of these 16 missions that we're going to launch under this faster, better, cheaper umbrella, he said, if we have a 100% success rate, that will be a failure. That will mean we weren't pushing the envelope hard enough. We weren't trying difficult enough things. Uh, and fascinatingly, uh, <laughs> of those first 10 missions, nine of them succeeded. They had a 90% success rate, which was way higher percent success rate than anybody ever anticipated for this 
you know, high speed, low cost access to space. Uh, but boy, good. Thank goodness one of them failed because otherwise the whole thing would have been a failure. <laughs> uh, right. <laughs> That's right. Yes. I love it. And That's I think so one of the things that a, a leadership message like that does for your, for your community and it's on a smaller scale, same thing that the, the failure cake does when you set one up in the cafeteria, it creates that psychological safety. It, it, it helps contribute to a culture of, of a high trust culture. That's right. Where you're safe. It's, it's a, it's an acceptable place to be honest. Uh, and, and boy, being honest and, and sharing actually what happened, that should come naturally to engineers because we're supposed to be all about data. Uh, but it can be challenging because engineers are also human, at least most of them are. And, you know, we, we still have to overcome that natural inclination to do self-preservation and to, you know, to not really trust the people around us because we're afraid of um, being made fun of or being looked down upon or, hey, you, did, you didn't succeed. But when we recognize that all of us are there, it, it really helps create that environment of, of high trust and, and psychological safety, which is so critical to doing experiments and, uh, and, and making significant uh, progress and, and innovating. It's critical, I think, too, the resiliency of doing that, because it is really difficult after you hear no or after your, your, your idea gets shelved or after maybe you try a first experiment and it fails and maybe you try a 10th experiment and it still fails to come back to the lab bench or come back to the computer, come back to your team and try again. Yeah. It, it's, it can be very deflating and difficult to be an innovator and to think innovatively, whether you're officially labeled someone on the innovation team in your organization or not, right? Organizations at this point want all of their people to think of themselves as innovators. And that takes a lot of mindset and resilience to know and accept that, hey, it's okay if 50% of my ideas don't even get past the idea realm, or it's okay if... Um, you know, it, like that there's a, there's a certain way of measuring and sharing and creating a culture that's accepting of, of those failures. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even beyond okay, it's important that a number of our things did not succeed. And I, th I think that's what we heard from, you know, Dan Bolton yes. with NASA. He's like, it is important that we try enough, that the things we're trying are hard enough that some of them won't work out. Like that's a sign that we're on the right track. Whereas if everything we attempt succeeds, then, then we're probably aiming too low. Uh, yeah. what, a, what a great leadership message. Uh, and so then they had seven years of a, I think a 62% success rate uh, across the faster, better, cheaper portfolio overall. And um, yeah, boy, if, if, if any given organization could just have seven good years of, of doing that kind of work, uh, boy, I'm going to call that a win. Definitely. Can you share if, if successful failure is really about learning, mm -hmm. what are some of the strategies that you see organizations taking to remember that learning to share it um, I, i'm imagining storytelling can play an important role yeah I, I think um i like the idea of collecting uh collecting your failures so for example ben and jerry's has their their flavor graveyard uh, up in, at their factory in vermont so it's on the side of a hill and it's actual granite tombstones and <laughs> on these tombstones they have engraved the names of ice cream flavors that they don't sell anymore you know and, and but, some of them were like some of my favorites are on that tombstone <laughs> and, and uh, a Dublin mudslide. Oh my gosh, I love Dublin mudslide and they don't make it anymore um, because it stops selling. And so uh, others, they, you know, they tried it for a year and, and, it, and it didn't, didn't go anywhere. Uh, and so what this does is it celebrates the fact that we tried some things that recognize that hey, these things didn't work out. We, we, they, they didn't sell. So we stopped making them. But we're going to collect the list. And that means any new person with a new idea for a new Ben and Jerry's flavor knows that, uh, you know, the worst that can happen is, is my, my proposed new flavor ends up in, in the flavor graveyard. Like, yeah. that's okay. I wouldn't be the first one to have failed. So doing it publicly, doing it transparently, doing it visibly. Uh, and you can go to their website and, and the, the whole flavor graveyard is online as well. You just don't get the free samples if you're not there in person. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's I just a, a terrific example of, you know, well beyond the, my usual military NASA uh, area of research and, and stories, even something as as relatively simple as ice cream can can do this type of thing where we study, we document, we share, we talk about, we reflect on our uh, our, our, our failures and you know, the things we used to do, things that we don't do anymore because again, they just sort of stopped selling for whatever reason. 
you know, something I love too about that example in the flavor graveyard is when you go onto the site, you can click a button that says resurrect this flavor and tell us what you'd like to see make a comeback. Wait, we can and, resurrect? Uh, oh my gosh, I didn't know that. I need to go there and uh, ask them to bring <laughs> Dublin Mudslide back. <laughs> yes, yes, you definitely should. And there's a lesson to that too, I think, right? Like there, there's a process of being able to keep a visible and present storytelling uh, sort of archive, and I hate the word archive actually because that sort of signifies that it's stuck, dusty in a basement somewhere. But a living and breathing space where we are accounting for those failures, and and also have the ability to let people take them off the shelf and play around with them and learn those lessons and and see you know maybe the maybe the technology wasn't there when this idea was first around but now it is or maybe the right partnership didn't exist then but now it does or the right market opportunity so really if we don't play and interact with the stories of our failures then they'll just sit collecting dust you use such an important word there's one of my favorite words and that is play uh, and I think storytelling and, and playfulness go together. I think if we're not playful with our stories, we're, we're doing it wrong. Uh, and so that's one of the other ways we can help create that high trust, psychological safety around failure is by adopting a playful approach to it, where it's it's not all serious and doom and gloom. It is um, whimsical almost. And, and actually in my, my <laughs> uh, latest book, Lift, uh, I do describe it as a whimsical storytelling uh, about some really serious topics. Uh, yeah. So that combination of, of whimsy with engineering pragmatism, if you can blend those two together, uh, I think it really makes the stories much more memorable, much, much clearer, uh, and, and they just they land, they land better. I completely agree. And this is, you know, the inspiration behind this conversation is your, your beautiful ability to take complex technical ideas or complex approaches to innovation and to simplify it through story and bring it to life through story. And of course, we're always looking for that at Untold. So I am so grateful for this conversation. If you have not read the book Lift, please go check it out. You can buy it on Lulu. Is that right? That's right. L-U-L-U.com. Yep. Um, and Dan, where can our listeners find you online? Oh, sure. Um, so you can find me over at the Dan Ward. So T-H-E and then my name, Dan Ward. Dot com is my, my personal website. Uh, you can download an excerpt from chapter three for the Lyft book uh, and a bunch of other articles and, and things and excerpts from my, my first two books are, are there as well. Uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, also at the Dan Ward. I don't do a ton of tweeting, but I'm, I'm there periodically. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I'm so, so grateful you made time to be on the podcast. Thank you so much. I've loved this conversation today. Oh, this has been a blast for me. So appreciate the chance to, uh, to be part of this conversation. Uh, and I'll leave you with one final thought. Uh, a good friend of mine once said that if you reduce a story to a point, you're likely to miss the story. And, and he said, you know, a story should have a point, but a story should also be more than just a point. And so he was, you know, the best stories have layers and, and, multiple meanings and, and a lot of things that we can keep coming back to them uh, and learning new things from the stories all the time. So uh, I just so appreciate the work you do around storytelling and just helping to foster more of that capacity uh, in this uh, in this innovation space. So thank you. Thank you so much for that final point. That is, that's beautiful. And it, it, uh, I, I think, you know, this, this idea of creating engagement around innovation, it, it has to come from multi-layered approaches like that so um so yeah we're, we're in it to tell more stories and i appreciate that we've been able to to talk about why that matters today hey thanks so much this has been a blast all right talk to you soon dan all right take care thanks for listening to this week's episode be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation you can find us at untold content